a company planned its annual picnic. This particular year, the company rented two boats. They had an idea. They invited their rival company to put together a row team. They put together a row team, and they were going to have a race as part of the big annual picnic. The day arrived. It was a gorgeous day. Uh, bands were playing. They had banners. Uh, the race started, and it could not have gone worse for the host company because the rivals began rowing, and they took an early lead. They stretched out that lead and never looked back, and they embarrassed the host company. Won by a large margin. The, the managers of the host company, they were embarrassed, so they put together a team to study what went wrong and how do we not do this next year. The team spent three months studying this, and they came back, and this was their conclusion at that point. Uh, the rival team had been unfair because they had eight people rowing and one person shouting out instructions. Meanwhile, the host company had one person rowing and eight people shouting out instructions. They spent four more months coming up with game plan. This is what they came back with. Our guy has to row faster. Not quite what we would expect. I think we both understand that the humor behind this, but, but the real life point. When we start talking about teamwork, we need a team to work together to follow the leader. And one of the big problems we have in society today is that everybody wants to shout out instructions, but there are no hands to work. We're going tonight to one of my favorite Old Testament stories. It's the book of Nehemiah. And what we find in Nehemiah is we find this great book on leadership, but we also find this great story of teamwork. But trust me, it's much more than that. Because what we will see tonight is that Nehemiah was a great man of prayer. He was an organized leader. He planned and he prayed. He faced a lot of criticism as he brought together people of Jerusalem to rebuild the wall around this once great city. This was a people that they were really struggling. They were struggling to find hope in this particular time. As we follow through the story, we're going to find out as people worked as a team. They worked side by side. They worked hand in hand. They worked with all their heart. They had a mind to work. And I'm giving you phrases that for the most part are found throughout this story. Also, I look forward to sharing that with us. Um, great team with an outstanding leader. We follow Nehemiah from the moment that he first learned about the condition of the wall to the time when he went to the king and he asked for help. He went and he began the construction. They faced the criticism. They finished the wall. There was a time of spiritual revival. The book even includes this part of the story where Nehemiah returned and had to make some changes in things that were going on upon his return. Now we will only get through half of the story tonight. Uh, there is a lot to be found in Nehemiah. So we're going to go through, well, chapter 6, verse 15 is probably our final verse of the night. But I'd like for us to get started. Here we go. Plato said, Wise men talk because they have something to say. Fools because they have to say something. And as we begin, as we first see Nehemiah in action, Nehemiah chapter 1, what we're going to find is his wisdom. We're going to find his wisdom in asking questions, in finding out about the condition of Jerusalem and the people that were there, to, to find the wise things that he has to say, that he's devoting this time in prayer. And that's really what we see in Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's look in the first four verses. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile 
and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So this begins, Nehemiah is, is not in Jerusalem. He, in fact, there's quite a distance that separates. But he finds out about the condition of Jerusalem and the people that are there. He asked about that. He asked good questions. And he received this report. And one of the things I love about this story is that when he heard these things, he took these things to heart. It really impacted him. It says for some that this was not just a, an, an instant momentary action. They go, okay, well, let's get back to life as normal. That was not what happened with Nehemiah. This was a life-altering moment when he heard this news because it changed the trajectory of, of his leadership, of things that were close to his heart. Look at this. He mourned. He fasted and he prayed. What we have in uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, is we have a, a prayer. And I'm going to call this a season of prayer. Because from all indications, this is indicative of prayer that were offered for four months before he went to the king to ask for help about rebuilding that wall. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5, Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant of love with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Now, Nehemiah is going to have a lot to say in that prayer. He speaks, though, beginning of God's greatness. He's going to talk about the sin. He's going to confess the sin of the people. He's going to remind God of the promise that He had made to bring those people back to Jerusalem if there was repentance. He's also going to talk about that, that as, as I go about the Father, use me. I, I just love this. I, I love the, the contents of that prayer that we see in this season of prayer that went on for a number of months. Then there came a time that he had a conversation. He needed to have a conversation. That was one of the first big barriers in order for him to do anything was to have a conversation with the king. Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king, which doesn't sound necessarily like much, but it was a really important position. There was a lot of trust that was established between Nehemiah and King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah had never been sad in the king's presence before. That's probably a good thing because it was forbidden to be sad in the king's presence. If you were a servant of the king, as Nehemiah was, you just simply forgot about your problems when you went into the presence of the king. But then there's Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So the king asked him, what do you want to do? Now in chapter 1, we have this example of a season of prayer. In chapter 2, verse 4, it says that he, he prayed and then he gave the king an answer. So again, both are bathed in prayer, but it's two different kinds of prayer, if you will. Before Nehemiah spoke a word to the king, he needed to have that final prayer where he asked the Lord. He just know he's asking him to bless the words, bless him with courage, bless him with wisdom to be able to share these things to the king. The king granted Nehemiah's request to let him go and to help rebuild that wall in Jerusalem. When he asked Nehemiah, how long will you be gone? Nehemiah gave a, a thought out time frame of when he would return. But Nehemiah was prepared. He had been thinking and he had been organizing this. And he told the king that he would need some things to, to help 
And so he got the king to write some letters. There were also some materials that were given, and Nehemiah was ready to go. Uh, it is, it's said that it's like a 700-mile journey uh, from where Nehemiah was to Jerusalem. So Nehemiah sets out in uh, this journey. He wanted to take some time to, to look at the situation himself. I think this is really wise too. When Nehemiah got there, you know people have to look at that and go, who is this and what is this about? But Nehemiah didn't answer right away. He went to Jerusalem after staying there for three days. I set out during the night with a few others. It says that he set out in the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. Nehemiah said, I, I heard the report that I received, but I need to see this firsthand. So he goes about and he wants to get a first-hand view to see the situation, to see what this project is going to entail. And it was only then, after he had seen it for himself, that he spoke to the people in Jerusalem. This is chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. They began this good work. We haven't read the first two chapters word for word. Hopefully in your Bible study you have been able to do this. But I want you to, to, I want you to notice this. I want you to notice the pronouns that are used. This is a very important leadership trait. Nehemiah didn't talk about you and your problems. He did not distance himself from the people. He identified with the people. In fact, to give an example back to chapter 1, verse 7, this is part of Nehemiah's prayer. He says, We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. So Nehemiah identifies with the problem. He knows he is part of the problem. And he wants to be part of the solution. When he confessed sins, he confessed his sins along with the sins of people. Uh, leaders have to understand that. Uh, whether it's a preacher, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a leader in the church, we have to understand we are not without sin. And when we stand up to address the church, uh, whether we're leading in personal work or, or whatever the case may be, we need to be honest about who we are. And there are times that I stand before you and, and it really troubles me that I'm sharing this because I know how much I struggle with the very things that I'm sharing with you. And, and I often, I try to do my very best to be up front to confess that before you. I, I don't want you to think that I think I'm better. Than, no, I know we and I know our problems. And we need to be willing to be part of that. So Nehemiah had identified as part of the problem. Look at that stuff. He identified as part of the solution. He said, you see the trouble we are in, but here we go. Come let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. He identified himself as part of the problem and part of the solution. That's when the people responded to him by saying, let us start rebuilding. In chapter 1, Scripture described the people of Jerusalem as a people in disgrace. Nehemiah identified with them. They found hope. He showed them his plans. He pointed them to God, and they rose to the occasion. Now, if we stopped at the end of verse 18, we would have this, uh, this idea that everyone was excited about this idea. And that would not be accurate. Because there's going to be a small group of people that are troublemakers. They are troublemakers. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. 
What is this you are doing, they ask. Are you rebelling against the king? Are you rebelling against the king? Now this, by the way, is not the first time their names have appeared in the book. If you go back to chapter 2, verse 10, when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. So they've been upset from the whole time that they heard that Nehemiah had even arrived in town. But now that there is an effort to start this rebuilding project, they begin to mock and they begin to ridicule. I like um, I like this particular quote. I ran across this several years ago. It says, don't hang around people who have given up on their dreams because they're coming after yours next. Really powerful. Don't hang around people who have given up on their dreams because they're coming after yours next. I don't know if that exactly describes a Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and Geshem, but I'm going to tell you they were after the dream of these Jews in Jerusalem, from Nehemiah all the way down to the workers. They're setting out to mock them, to ridicule them, to discourage them, and to intimidate them. They're going to do whatever it takes to be able to stop this effort. They question Nehemiah's plan. Man, why do you want to do this? Yeah, critics have a way of doing that. They can take somebody, this happens even today in church, that critics can take somebody that has a really good plan, but rather than to support and encourage that, they can just ask one question that is so deflating. We have to have the faith and the courage in church to not let critics like that discourage us. Is there going to be time when when people might come and they might have questions for clarifications, questions for to, to better the idea? Yes, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people that the very first words out of their mouth, it deals with criticism. The very first words out of their mouth is they want to shut it down. Why? Because they don't want to do anything. They don't want to do anything and they don't want us to do anything. We need to be aware of people like that. All right, so the work begins. Nehemiah chapter 3, one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible. It is just simply a list of names. It's a list of names and where the people were. But it is a great picture of teamwork. Everyone is putting their hand to the plow. Everyone, and we see so many that are involved in this. It's great. But look what happens. Chapter 4 begins. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life on those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, oh, what they're building, even if a fox climbing up on that wall, it would break down their wall of stones. Man, they really know how to dig, don't they? They really know how to discourage. I mean, I'm looking at what Tobiah has to say here. I mean, he's just saying, I mean, what, what you're doing... That's great that you're doing all of this work, but it is so substandard. Your resources aren't good. You're not working hard enough. You're not working well enough. A little fox is going to crawl right over that. It's just going to crumble back down. It causes people to question their task. And that's what Sam Ballad and Tobiah were all about. If they could change the way that the people saw those rocks, they could shut down the project if they could see the rocks of not being able to be able to put back together to rebuild that wall, if they could see the task is too great or the resources not good enough, they could shut down the project. But what Nehemiah did, he helped them see that that wall could be rebuilt. Nehemiah had in his mind this picture of a final project because that is, friends, the definition of vision. 
It's beginning with the end in mind. It's knowing that as He came together and as He talked to the Jews, He's not going to ask them to start something that they can't finish. He believes that with the blessing of God and, and the help that He has received along the way and the number of people that are willing to come together and work, He sees this as a project that can be finished. That a people in disgrace are going to be a people to have a source of pride, of being able to come back together again and to be able to have this wall as this source of security. Sam Ballin and Tobiah didn't want to see any progress. They wanted to keep that pile of rubble and they wanted to keep seeing those people in disgrace. Nehemiah chapter 5 deals with some internal conflict, which by the way can shut down a project. And it's where Nehemiah really had to stop and bring some people together. There's pretty good evidence that in Nehemiah chapter 5 that the work may have even stopped so that Nehemiah could address this, because there were some nobles that, that they were too good to work. You also had the fact that there were some that needed help, and so they're borrowing money, and there's interest that's being charged, and it is just beginning to, to mushroom on them, and they, they, they don't know what to do. And so that personal problem is, is preventing progress with the wall. So Nehemiah comes together, and, and he takes care of business. In chapter 6, Sam, Ballot, Tobiah are right there again. They attempted this time, they had, in chapter 4, they had just uh, tried to discourage the whole work by just kind of making fun, mocking, ridiculing the whole project. Did the same thing in chapter 2. What we see in chapter 6 is a personal threat against Nehemiah. And it starts with a rumor. It starts with a rumor about Nehemiah. It's in an effort to discredit his ability to lead. In simple words, there were accusations that were lies, they were slanderous, but if anyone listened to them, they could have been devastating to Nehemiah and to the efforts to rebuild the wall. Nehemiah chapter 6 verses 5 through 7 really kind of gives us an idea of what that rumor sounded like. Then the fifth time, Sanballat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter, in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are rebuilding the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah... Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. Uh-oh. This has the potential to be a really serious problem. This can be a, a great issue. Now, one of the lessons that we learn from Nehemiah, there's so many, is of how to respond to criticism. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 20. Let's look at this. This is him. He's answering the same group of guys. He said, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. What he's saying there is, This isn't your concern. This isn't your concern. We don't have to answer every grain of criticism that comes. Um, chapter 4, verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till, uh, till it reached half its height for the people work with all their heart. What does that say? They're not going to let Sam Ballot and Tobiah and Gashem discourage them. They continued to work. They continued to put this thing together. Then chapter 6, verse 8, look at this. This is when Nehemiah actually replied to that letter, the unsealed letter. I sent them this reply. Nothing like what you were saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. You're just making it up out of your head. One translation puts it this way. There is no truth to any part of the story. And that's it. Nehemiah didn't feel a need to defend himself. He just simply spoke up and said, what you're saying is not true. And then he moved on. Now there's a point when they are, are feeling threatened that Nehemiah will get uh, the workers together and they work hand in hand. Um, you have... One that's working, one that's guarding. And then they do that, uh, they, they swap responsibility. That's the kind of situation that we ran into. 
uh, as we read through this story. And so Nehemiah has a plan, and he made adjustments as necessary in that, but you can't read the story without getting to this part in chapter 6. So the wall, chapter 6, verse 15, the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Now, that's, that's just the first half of the story. And that's really all we have time for tonight. Because what we see after that is it's not just the completion of a wall, but we, we've had these people come together. And, and there has been discussion because Nehemiah has continually pointed to, to the blessing of God in this effort. So we see this time of great spiritual revival take place. And that is where Ezra again comes in and is a vital part of this story. Where the book of the law is read, it's explained, and the people respond to that. And there's a time of confession. It's just a wonderful time of worship and confession and study and, and dedication to the Lord. But I wanted us to look at this from the standpoint of, of Nehemiah coming and, and the, the prayer that he had put into this, the heart that he had as a leader, the organization he's put into this, and his ability to bring together a team of people to work for this good cause. Uh, one more quote to share with you. Set goals, high goals for you and your organization. And when your organization has a goal to shoot for, you create teamwork, people working together for a common good. And I like that. Set high goals and then bring those people together and, and encourage them. Um, we want to challenge people to do something great. How that fits in church is God is the one that has established the standard. He's the one that has put the mission and the purpose before us. God is the one who has raised the standard, who has put this vision. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He said, go everywhere and teach everybody. That's the vision. And we do not want to be like Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and Geshem and try to discourage that mission. Oh, that can be done. We don't want to try to discourage others in their time. They may get a little fired up for the Lord. That's the phrase we use from this morning's lesson. They may get a little fired up for the Lord. And, and if that's the case, I hope that their fire is contagious and it causes others to get excited in wanting to carry out what the Lord has given us to do. Now, you see, that's a, that's a church... No, it's just about teamwork, but the Bible is going to use this picture, this analogy of us as the body of Christ with Christ as the head. And we work together for a common good, but that common good is to honor God, is to love God, to love our fellow man, and to, to, to serve our fellow man. And when we follow God's plan, and we are following Him, and we've been seeking Him in prayer, and seeking His will and His way, then we need to expect good things to happen. And when they do, we give praise and glory to God. Understand this, church, that when we start striving to make a difference, there are going to be obstacles. There will be critics. There may be critics in society. There will be critics around us. And it may be even critics within the church. And we need to understand that. We need to be prepared for that. Because as the body of Christ, we want to do something great. For we want to keep our eyes focused on the Lord and keep our eyes focused on the mission that He has put before us. I'm excited about some things that I'm seeing at Mall Road right now. God has blessed us with a number of visitors over the last few months. A number of them, are, are, or a number of you, are placing membership with us. And may we give thanks to God for that. I hope that we as a church family can continue to come together as we strive to, to serve our community in recognizing some practical needs. I hope that we as a church family can recognize the fact that we're in a community where there are people that need to hear the gospel. And we will be challenged to accept that mission before us and to share that. I hope that we can understand the, the opportunity that we have to, to be this this light on a hill, 
that impacts our community, but also impacts something much bigger than that as we strive to, to, to be a blessing, whether it's to missionaries, whether it's to, to good causes like the Church of Christ Disaster Relief that's helping in, in the hurricane-stricken areas. We have such an opportunity to do good things. Friends, don't let others discourage us. Keep our eyes focused on the Lord. Keep our eyes focused on the goal before Him. And let's leave this to God and watch God bless this work.